future mommy or forever auntie? Oh my God, that's such a heavy one to start with. <laughs> mama, because I get it from my mama. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's Maureen, and this is my podcast, Weighing In on the Way In, where I speak to dynamic women behind the scenes in the entertainment business and find out what they did or didn't do to obtain their current career position. And there's an emphasis on current because let's face it, we move on and we lean in closer to more purpose-driven life. And along the way, we amass a gold mine of experience that I feel is worth sharing. So today's guest, Fab Rock, has a whole lot to share. Let's get into it. I'm thrilled to have on the show the incredibly beautiful and multi-talented Fab Rock. Fab is a creative director, writer, producer, DJ, Reiki, and yogi. With years of experience under her belt in directing, marketing, and ad campaigns, Fab Rock has mastered the art of developing and directing compelling video content for brands, and her talent goes beyond visuals. As a skilled writer, she's crafted promotional campaigns as well as movie and television trailers. What sets Fab apart is her unique perspective and eye-catching lens through which she weaves her storytelling magic. She's a firm believer in the power of authentic narratives, ones that resonate deep within our souls. With an eclectic taste in music and a keen ear for what's hot, her skills as a DJ extend to curating music and scores in all the content she produces. Each note is carefully chosen to enhance the story, creating an immersive and unforgettable experience for the audience. It's this seamless fusion of storytelling and music curation that truly sets her work apart. Notable projects include BET's 20s, 2190's Looking for a Sign and Asking for a Friend, Netflix's Strong Black Lead, The Block is Hot with Hashtag Booked, and Blavity's A Week in My Wash and Go, as well as Travel and Noir's Bougie and Abroad. Please give it up for the amazing Fab Rock. Welcome to the show. <laughs> that was great. Thank you so much. I always like to start off with humble beginnings. So where did young Fab grow up and what's your background? I grew up in Rockland County in New York. I like moved to Rockland and I was like, like four or five, whatever. So um, I grew up there and during college, I was working in like hospitality. So I was like bartending, I was serving. Um, and then like my first job out of college was in HR at um, Pearson Education, like the company that does like the Penguin books and all the education oh, books. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, I need to be on my feet. Like I need to, I need to do some, <laughs> I need to be in the field. And so I pivoted to events. Um, and so I was like an event coordinator for one of like the Iron Chef, you know, um, restaurants that was in this hotel. And I was doing like a lot of like suit corporate events. I moved to the city after that. Um, so I was working in Manhattan. That's where I kind of like the producing really started there, but I was on the event side doing like event activations. I went from there to Essence Magazine and I learned a lot about like ad sales, ad content and, and everything like that. And then I kind of just bounced around after that I was freelancing for a while. I started learning how to DJ and then- a Wait, 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 forward. you have like a long list of things. I have to, let's backtrack, hold on. <laughs> That's the humble beginnings, my bad. <laughs> like, no, no, no. Hold on. So when you got into event activations, how was that process for you? Was it difficult to get into that? Or was it like I sent out my resume? Like, what was that like? I remember like being at that HR job, which was in Jersey at the time and I was living in Jersey um, mm -hmm. and just applying to a bunch of like event coordinator jobs. This is like, I guess when these search sites actually worked and you didn't need to like advertise. <laughs> Absolutely. You didn't need to like know somebody. And so my resume actually hit and I got a call and then I like I had to like truck it into the city for the interview and I ended up getting the job. And in the same way I got the Essence job too, like I like applied online 
<laughs> a concept. I know. Yeah, um, I know. Because like when normally when you throw things into LinkedIn, you're like, I'll never see it again. I don't know if I'll ever hear back. But yeah, you have to like work. into LinkedIn and know the recruiter and know somebody that works there and know their cousin. And it's just like <laughs> exact. I mean, it's it's true. Who it's who you know, you know. But sometimes mm-hmm. every once in a while, you get through all of that fluff. And yes, your, your sure. actual resume makes it in. Before we go into essence, when you looked for the event activation jobs, was it a job detail that appealed to you? Or like, how is that something that, because that's not a typical job, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. not, not to say it's not a typical job, because nowadays there are so many things that are new under the sun as far as jobs are concerned. But like, if you think about like typical like ad jobs or, whatever, what was it about this particular job that appealed to you? Like you said, like, okay, I think I can do this. I've always been a big like foodie. I'm really, I used to watch like the cooking channel all the time as a kid. And so I think that's why when I was in college, I was working at like all these different types of restaurants. Girl, I've had every single type of job, like literally. (laughs) And so it made sense for me to transition from front of house restaurant to back of house, like more operations and events. The job description, it was attached to a hotel, it was attached to a restaurant, and it was doing like events that were, like it was Midtown, so like East Side. So more like Chase, like very suit, like very corporate Corporate, stuff. And coming from HR, I was already like in that mindset. Like I remember like buying a suit after college to like go on interviews, like <laughs> things that like I haven't worn a suit to an interview in a decade, probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um I was already in that mind frame. So I was like, oh cool, like I can do these events for these like notable companies. But also like Jeffrey Zakarian was, it was his restaurant and like I, I was a fan. So I was like, great. This sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. Okay. So now you move over to Essence. Essence was a dream job for me. Um, in 2009, I went to Essence Festival with like my best friend um, and her mom. And it was like the first time I was in New Orleans, um, the first time I was at Essence Festival. And I was just like, I need to work for them. Like, this is like... A massive, like Janet Jackson performed that year. Who else performed that year? Like Charlie Wilson. I saw everybody. It was a great year. Um, But I was just like, yeah, I need to work for them. Like I already, you know, had the magazines. So when I I applied and I got the job, I was like literally so geeked (laughs) because I I wanted to get out of events. I wanted to do something else um, at that time. What was the EIC at the time? Vanessa? Gosh, why am I forgetting? I had interviewed her. I know, I want to look at I'm forgetting her last name. That's crazy. Uh, Vanessa DeLuca. <laughs> Vanessa DeLuca, yeah. right? Yes, okay, yes, yes. Okay, we got it. <laughs> okay. Me and James, I feel like I'm the worst with that. It was dope. I was on like the ad side. So it was like, it was funny because the office was on the other side of Manhattan. And then I finally fully like moved into the city and was living in Brooklyn. Yeah. And it was it was great. It was, you know, I got to like go to concerts last minute. Like I, I went to like Yeezus by myself, like floor seats, nice. like, nice. you know, you know, when the client like relationships were there and stuff, but like, it was great. And it was, it was not great at the same time. It was an experience for sure. <laughs> what was not great about it? And how long were you um, there? Maybe like a year and a half. Okay. And then I, and then I left and then I went back, which is okay. a common thing. <laughs> for like a few months but it was just like you know sometimes I think some of these legacy brands the structure of their company is very hard to move up in like they had entry-level jobs and then they had directors like there were right. no in between so like if you got to a place where it was like you wanted to do more there wasn't really much room for growth the joke used to be like it's a revolving door like you have to leave to come back to, right. to get you know <laughs> some other experience and then come back but when you went like, back what did you go back as like what was your title oh no i went back as the same like i had left and then like went back like six months after or something okay like what was yeah. your title I was a ad sales coordinator that was essence and then you started talking about music so so you went from yeah. from from essence to now music i had met my old business partner at essence he was on the marketing side uh, Rondell, who now uh, he did like Soul Society. He was building that up at that time too. Okay. And so we started we started throwing these day parties in New York because we kind of were just like 
you know, the, there was a shift happening in New York with like people weren't really trying to go to these promoter clubs. The day parties were like becoming like a vibe. This is also when like your, you know, like your heady paloozas, your grits and biscuits, like were kind of like evolving as well. And so we were just like, we just threw, we started throwing these day parties. And then eventually when I got, uh, I started learning DJing, I started using the day parties we were throwing to practice in real yeah. time. Uh-huh. But I went to this production school to learn DJing for like three months and didn't tell anybody because I wanted to make sure like I wanted to do it before yeah. I started announcing it. Yeah. Um, and yeah. And then once I started playing, like people heard me and they were like, oh, you should do my party. And then it was just like, it just kind of like blew up from there. Nice. Um, and I was able to travel and do a lot of stuff like through DJing. It was great. I thought day parties was like an LA thing. I didn't, I didn't even know it was like a new york thing oh yeah yeah like a day party like a brunch thing like Mm -hmm. we used to when i had first moved to new york like unlimited brunch was a thing like to to a point where at some point the city banned it and then like all these people like all types of white people black people asian people all came together like you can't take away our unlimited mimosas (laughs) and so it was like crazy time in New York this is like when Uber first came out and it was like four dollars to ride places like yeah back then I'm so old talking like this <laughs> how did your fam react to you pursuing DJing because I see on your bio you have the 80 flag I'm Haitian too <laughs> yeah oh gosh you're in no. <laughs> Well, I have a different set of parents because like everything that I've ever done or my siblings have done, they've always supported us. They were just like, get your degree. You can do whatever. Do what makes you happy. But I know that Mm -hmm. in a lot of Caribbean households, they're like, you want to do what? (laughs) It's not business. It's not not doctor. Like what? So (laughs) it's funny because um, I have a cousin who is a DJ. He's based out of Miami. He's been a DJ as long as I've known him. He's older than me, but it's like, you know, he's made a career out of being a DJ. My dad is a musician. Like he's a composer, he's a director, like he's a producer, like he's done all these entertainment things his entire life. And then it was like, when me and my brother were like coming up and wanting to get into like the music and the arts and stuff, my mom was like, nah, it's crazy. I've seen it firsthand go to business school, like do, you know, the traditional thing. So when I did all that, and then I like somehow reverted back into music because I was doing other things at the same time, Mm -hmm. it wasn't like, you know, this big, like, what are you doing? But it definitely was just like, oh, okay. That's like cute little hobby or whatever. It wasn't until I went to London, I got flown out to London to DJ. I got to Nia to DJ. I was DJing like, in Nairobi in Kenya that oh my, my mom was gosh. Like, oh this is a thing like this is a this is a real thing like <laughs> and then it, she became very supportive but it was just funny in the beginning I think it was just like okay like sure right right sure, crazy um but I'm glad you have a, a you know a job and then right. I was like wow like reposting me on Facebook so <laughs> Now, now when it has some um, some credibility because you're getting yeah, flown out to all these different places, yeah. yeah. What's DJ money like? Uh, it depends. <laughs> it depends. The EDM world is totally different. Like if you look at your like Calvin Harris's and like those like Tiesto, like those big name, like or even the Las Vegas DJs, they're making tens of thousands of dollars per set. And then there's us, <laughs> us regulars. Full, like transparency in New York, I was mm-hmm. able to get to like 200 an hour um, rates as far as like regular parties for corporate, typically charge more, you know, mm-hmm. like a corporate, I've, I've, I've gotten paid a thousand dollars for an hour set from a corporate nice. um, before. Now in Dallas, <laughs> it's a little bit different. The culture is a little bit I don't want to say it's behind, but it, it's definitely, um, it's still on the like promoter ran type of energy. And yeah. when that essentially they're the middlemen for the venue. So it's like the venue has all these people to pay and the promoters have all these people to pay. And it's just like the DJ, I will, I will say, isn't like in my experience, hasn't been like the most respected in, in this city. Mm-hmm. And like there's people out here that got residencies they're DJing for free or like $50 an hour. And it's just like, 
it's not sustainable. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. it's a struggle here. Um, thankfully, I have like a network and I can I can fly back to like New York or like I have, you know, people that will book me even here. But yeah, it's, a, it's it really depends where and who you're DJing for, for sure. Okay. You initially had some hesitation when this next career step came to the mm-hmm. table because you went from management um, doing activations to be an assistant on this particular job. And then you got a call about this particular job. Talk mm-hmm. us through that and what the wow factor was for you to be like, okay, yes, I'm going to do this. Yeah. So it's so funny. Like, um, through my like career, I've experienced like a hand, like I've experienced a lot of highs, lows, like I've been laid off like maybe three or four times. And so I signed on to this like internal agency as a creative events manager, like their events lead. And they transitioned me into a creative producer there. And that's like, like one of my managers just saw it in me and she was like, we actually need this. Are you interested? And I was like, yeah, sure. And that's, it's, she was like, it's the same skill sets. And I love, you know, I always like highlight that because a lot of people will like try and gatekeep in the industry. And it's like, a lot of things are very teachable. Like you just need a little bit of guidance or coaching. The skill set Agreed. be the same. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> I, yeah, like I transitioned into a creative producer. I was doing that for a few months or like half a year, I think. And then and then half of our team got laid off. And so mm-hmm. I was like, damn, my coworker, you know, knew somebody that was hiring for an assistant. Uh to a director for a project. And I was like, oh, like in my head, I was just like, I just got to manager. Yeah, like, I don't want to oh go to assistant. <laughs> yeah, like how, like, what do you mean? But then she was like, yeah, well it's for Wu-Tang. And I was like, I mean, I can do that because <laughs> I'll check it out. And because she Wu-Tang Clan like, ain't nothing to- <laughs> I'm not going to even get into it, but it's just like, I, as a music lover, I was like, oh, Wu-Tang. Okay, cool. And then I found out it was with, um, the director was Chris Robinson. And I was like, okay, hold on. <laughs> so Chris I was Chris Robinson like, right, is famous for doing like all the top hip hop artists' music videos. Yeah. We could do a quick a list. I um, mean, 90s. Go Google it. it 90s. <laughs> yeah. Google, Google. Yeah. Google it. Yeah. But, you know, also... Atlanta, the movie, um, beautiful Pharrell Snoop Dogg video, like oh yeah, all music videos. So um, I was like, this sounds legit. And then and then they were like, well, it's in Staten Island. And I was like, ooh, because I had never been to Staten Island as a New Yorker. There's a joke that like, especially with Haitians, like you've been to Miami more than you've been to Staten Island, <laughs> New York. I mean, it's not just Haitians, but like, we just don't go to Staten Island. It's like, Shaolin for what? Like, we know Shaolin because of Wu-Tang Clan, like, for real. <laughs> literally. literally um, and we know, okay, it's one of the five boroughs. But then after that, it's like, go where? <laughs> <laughs> it's in a borough. <laughs> I didn't know we cred anyways. I'm not gonna talk to you about uh, Staten Island, but I was living in Harlem at that time, so I took you know several trains, the ferry, another train, and a and a mile walk to get to this interview. Mm-hmm. Um, that was five minutes, My <laughs> and gosh. then like you know a vibe check, you know type of thing. Sure. And then they called me, and they were like, "Yeah, you got it." And so thankfully, I only had to do that crazy commute twice and then I just had to like get to the director's van for the next like three months of when we were shooting but you know like Wu-Tang, American Saga, the Hulu show um, and it was like they had only casted two people they had casted RZA uh, as Ashton mm-hmm. and they had casted Power as Marcus Chandler who was in Power also <laughs> um, <laughs> but so I helped with like I was casting we were doing the development. We were working with wardrobe. We were working with the hair department. We were working with props, like literally from scratch, building this show up. Um, and then we shot the pilot. Yeah, it was incredible. It's like I could have paid for that. You know what I mean? Right. Like I could have paid for that experience versus like getting paid um, as an assistant. But it was incredible. I was in the, the van with RZA, with um, Alex who was the other writer on the show. Um, Method Man was there and I was like fangirling out. M-E-T-H-O-D, man. I mean, 
do you need anything? (laughs) (laughs) Trying to keep it together. Method looks like, you know, in his older age, he's just like totally changed. I had a crush on him when younger, but like now it's like, hey, (laughs) Meth. Yeah, and he's still living Staten Island, which is it's just funny. So it's just like, yeah, the project was, it was wild, it, and it was the middle of winter. I got like hypothermia one day oh, shooting because no. I, I didn't even know that I was supposed to dress in like ski suits, <laughs> like on set, you know. So it was just like, but I gained so much like knowledge working with Chris as a director. Like, I love that you said that you could have paid for that experience because nowadays. The, the culture of the younger generation is such that pay me now, I deserve to get paid. And I don't believe in the whole starving artist mm-hmm. thing anymore. I, I think that you should get paid for what you work with, for what you do and your talents, your gifts, your abilities. But I yeah. also feel like there's this mindset that I'm not doing anything for free. I, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't want to be an intern. I don't want to be an assistant. Pay me. Yeah. And I get that. But sometimes I feel like there's like, some humbleness missing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's tough because, and I think that that culture has evolved because of the previous culture taking advantage of our generation, like yeah. your Hot 97 Street team people. Like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. people like back when interns were not being paid and they were doing full-time work Yeah, as like, not even coordinators, but like as like leads and managers. And it was just like, that kind of birthed the next generation that was like, I'm not doing that because you know I can do the job and you're taking advantage of me. So I think there is a balance there. Like, again, as an assistant, I was making like um, 500 a week. You know what I mean? So like, but I'm, I'm, you know, I thankfully I didn't have to worry about food, transportation. I just had to take the train at God knows hours sometimes I got dropped off if if it made sense but Mm -hmm. like it was a a hustle like I'm saying I could have paid for it because people go to school and I didn't go to film school yeah no I totally Um, get that but at the same time like it's the capitalism that makes it all fucked up like ideally like if we weren't in this like inflation world where I like didn't have like I have to make these all these resources to survive then I think that the energy would be a little bit different but yeah it was priceless it was priceless learning like yeah so for sure. There's definitely a line between like saying yes to something that isn't going to pay because it has so much more value for your future and then yeah. saying, nah, I'm not doing that because you guys are about to like run me like a dog <laughs> and I'm going to get paid pennies. <laughs> yeah, this was definitely one of those. And th- and I deal with this in DJing too. Like sometimes people don't have the budget, but if I believe in the event um, or the person and there's like a, you know, a bigger picture, then I'll do it. But like for this, it was like I went from making like seventy five thousand dollars a year to five hundred dollars a week. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you know what, I mean? yeah. <laughs> what was your biggest takeaway from like from the whole experience that you still incorporate in your creative life today? Mm, that's a good question. I think that authenticity is a big thing. Like one thing I really admired about Chris is that like he's going to make sure it is right. Like. If it's not, you know what I mean? Like the amount of times, like even down to the jewelry that um, the characters are are wearing, especially because they're portraying real people who are mostly alive, you know, and well. And it's just like, and also like the importance of hiring someone who gets it from a personal level. You know, the project had a, a variety of directors after Chris. Um, and he was one of the executive producers as well but like I think that you can always tell if a a director or a team behind a project is not personally connected yeah to you a can. project you know what I mean? so yeah. it's like in the development process it's like we're going all the way down to the chain to the shoes no we didn't wear this in the 90s we wore this like yeah. you know what I'm saying like those small details really matter and so for me now and everything I do, like I really try to make it as authentic as possible. And if I'm not the resource, I find somebody that is. Nice, okay. Yeah. So you worked on a lot of Blavity projects. How did you get connected mm-hmm. with them? I was at uh, BET kind of ready for you know my next like challenge, my next role. 
and I saw that they were hiring uh, because they wanted to get into original content. So they were looking for a director to kind of build that out. And so actually a friend of mine, an old coworker, my coworker that worked with me at BET, she saw the role and she was like, you know, this sounds like like if you're interested, you should apply to this. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And the, my manager, when I was hired, he, he was Jermaine. um, Why can't I remember his last name, but Jermaine used to work at Vibe. Like, so he was very intertwined into like, you know, the culture, hip hop, all those things. So like we instantly like vibed because we just like spoke the same language. It was just like vibe essence, you know, like all the, all of the things. So So you went from Wu-Tang Clan and then to BET? So then we skipped over BET. Okay. How was was it over at BET? (laughs) It was, I mean, BET is really, it's, it's funny, like. Wu Tang was like I was in the field. It was only like three or four months, but mm-hmm. um, I learned. It was a crash course on like production, pretty much mm-hmm. um, as far as field production. Yeah. And then BET was kind of like the fundamentals as far as like what happens after you create a show or a movie. So mm-hmm. I really like within those four years got it was like school for me. Yeah. Like that was school, you know what I mean. Uh-huh. So I learned. I, about scripting um, at BET, editing, working with editors, like um, I, I got like a lot of my foundation from BET um, right. as as a writer producer and then a senior writer producer. It was fun. It was cool. Like the award shows, like the movies, like I touched everything while I was there. So it was nice. Nice. Did you foresee television? Or digital in in your future? No, and it's so it's really silly because my dad does all of this stuff, and it was just like <laughs> I don't understand like how I just I just wasn't I think because no shade, and I know my mom probably going to watch this, but like <laughs> <laughs> I was deterred away from entertainment because it's a crazy, you know what I mean? She used to be like these child stars are all. <laughs> Like and stuff like it's that. True though. Like I'm, I'm in the, I'm a producer. I own my own production company, Twelve Eighteen Media, and like I don't put my kid on social. Like it, I, I hide his face. Like if we do something because I want to, and I, it's just so much fun. I hide his face. I don't show him. He's not like. Yeah. It's weird because like because you know how it is, you just don't want to expose your kids to that. But I have get a feeling it. he's gonna get into it because mom and dad are both in that world. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. So, you know, I was deterred, but like I kind of ended up and, you know, everyone's journey is their journey. So I'm not there's no like resentment or anything there. But it's just funny because it's like if I had the foresight (laughs) in like high school to like I would have been that girl that was like producing Drake's music video at like 16. You know what I mean? Like, it could have been me. Like. (laughs) But yeah, like you said, your journey is your journey and it happened yeah. exactly the way it was supposed to, you know? Anything you learn as a pr- producer on set or in general that you can share? Because I know every time I produce anything, I always go back on my computer and write it in my drafts. Like, don't let this happen. Don't let this happen. Remember to do this. Like, what's something that you learned as a producer? I think producers are firefighters. Like, you're putting out fires, you're anticipating fires, and you're preventing fires. So like you're like playing chess. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Exactly. I think the best producers have like this decorum where they can talk to anybody, they can relate to anybody, and they can calm anybody down, including themselves. Like yeah. so I think that, you know, the personality and even and even like your your ADs, like your assistant directors, like the best ADs, like are so you know friendly but also like command the room very well yeah um and i think producers are the same way like you know production is just so crazy it's like we're there for 14 hours 15 hours like what you know however long like it doesn't have to be a drill sergeanty like yeah. ego shit like i try to keep my ego out of like everything yeah and especially if you're dealing with like talent yeah you're dealing with all kinds of personalities like went um down the rabbit hole of you (laughs) i say this like about all my guests but you know doing the research you have such a calm and grounded demeanor and as so as a fellow producer i know that that's essential and i wonder has anything ever rattled you on set 
and and how are you yeah, able to bring it from like 10 to one i've just never been the person that like would like show my ass at work for lack of better words like you know what i mean like at the end of the day especially like when i was at bet and being on set like i know i'm at work like i've never been someone that's like gone to work and then gone you know, to the happy hour and got litty and now yeah. everyone's talking about them. You know, the next day it's like, sure, I'll like, you know, I'll have a drink with y'all, but like, I'm at work. Right. So like, I think that <laughs> boundary has like kept me cool or at least, you know, in a in a place where things have gone wrong and, and been able to deal with it. I really admire people that like, when chaos is happening, they're very chill. And I think actually to my detriment, sometimes when I'm interviewing for jobs and I'm very chill, they get like, nah, she's too chill. And right. it's like, like, what do you want me to be high strung? Like, you know what I mean? It's That's just weird. But, um, you know, I've definitely, I've definitely been in a situation where I've like lost my cool before, but not on set, like maybe okay. like, in an office somewhere. <laughs> okay. When you were at BET, you worked on Lena Waits' 20s. Mm-hmm. And I know that you said that that's like your baby project. Talk to me about that project and some of the things that you did for it. I worked on season one and two, which was dope. I love that show so much and I hope they get a third season. Um, But basically I started working on it as a, when I started BT after Wu-Tang, I was a freelancer. And then like after a few months, they converted me to full time. So 20s was like my first project, even as a freelancer there. And because it was, you know, brand new to BT at the time, we got to really ideate around like how we're going to bring this show to our audience, knowing that the audience skews generally older. Yeah. And so, um, you know, me and my team, like we got to get together. It was just like, it was just so fresh and raw. And because like, you know, the demographic was literally me and my coworkers that, that were more on the younger side compared to the other people that had, you know, been at BET for a really long time. Mm -hmm. Um, It just felt very authentic to us. And it was like, you know, we're creating this for us. So, you know, we were able to to kind of push the parameters that BET normally had kind of stayed around for their other shows. You know, it was very fresh and and thankfully they trusted us to um to kind of take it there and then when we, we presented to lena she loved it also so then it was like you know like, yeah I loved it. Like, like then i became emotionally attached to the characters like as actresses and as like humans in real life yeah and it was just like i just really wanted them and the show to win because it's just like the it's written so well and like yeah i, I do it yeah. yeah lena's amazing what was your title over at BET? So were you in post-production or on the just creative advertising side? So I was in our brand creative department, which was essentially like the internal agency for BET as a whole. Got uh, it. BET, 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 her. So I was a, a writer producer. They kind of merged uh, the two, but we would work like closely with the marketing team, but I would do like all the promotion or like the 360 campaign mm-hmm. uh, ideation through execution. And your writing skills, where did that come up in your trajectory that we've discussed so far? Yeah, um, it's funny because in high school, I was told I was a shit writer. Like, (laughs) it was just like, people used to like be hating on my writing because I just wrote very um, like authentic to myself. Mm -hmm. And then I think by the time I was like, you know, like 25, it was like trendy to write more with like a personified tone or like you know sound like a person versus like worrying about MLA and all of the like you know Mm -hmm. those things Mm -hmm. and so then my writing style became like coveted and it was just like okay as a creative producer that's where I like really leans into like uh, when I worked for Riot that um, internal agency I was I mentioned earlier that's where like I was really champion as far as my writing because it was I was doing pitch decks and um, pitching like branded companies content to companies um, yeah. and doing scripts for them because it was like, you know, advertising changed from the time I was in college to now. It's like people want to know like who the brands are, what their voice is. Before it was just like, oh, just sell me something. It doesn't really matter. 
Yeah, now so, they really want to connect with the company. Yeah, like look at like Ben and Jerry's is always my favorite example. Like Ben and Jerry's gonna come with the heat, and they're gonna, you know what I mean? Like they're they're and they're just like social justice focused. Like they're ice cream. Like you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. so cool. Yeah, <laughs> and people care. People care. They do so, because it's, yeah. it's now you know there people are more conscious about what they associate or affiliate themselves with. It's not just about like you said, just sell me something. I wonder yeah. how different would you say promotional campaigns are from the television and movie trailers that you worked on, or even if you've written your own personal like script. When you're doing like promotional work and ad work you still always have to think about like the audience and so my personal writing doesn't always align with another brand's you know like goals or their consumer thankfully at BET more times than not I was speaking to my audience like my like basically to myself or at least like with give or take 10 years um but sometimes like I've had clients um where it's like or like you know I'm not gonna I'm not, I'm not somebody that watches sisters, but I've written promotional campaigns for sisters. And I'm, I've been aware of like the lens that you need for sisters. That's, it's a little bit more like soapy and it's a little bit more like, I don't want to say like pungent, but like, just like more clickbaity in a way, Yeah, not in a bad way, but just like roping in the audience immediately using big words, using fast words, bong, 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 you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, flash, 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 Tuesdays at nine. Right, got it, <laughs> but, got it. <laughs> but like for 20s or for me, it's like, it's a little bit more rooted in like the storytelling, mm-hmm. a little bit of like, you know, razzle dazzle drama, but like people get emotionally attached to like the bigger picture with like a 20s versus like a sisters and they're emotionally attached to like the drama. The drama, yeah. So you totally yeah. get it. What's your creative process like? And have you ever been stumped with coming up with an idea or came up with mm-hmm. one that, you know, you just didn't even like? Oh yeah, um, man. I think the creative, the creative process like all the time is just like pivoting, especially when you're doing stuff for other people. Mm-hmm. And like, I learned very early to get you know, detached from the outcome of that so that I'm not taking things personally. Cause I'll be like, man, this is really good. And then they'll be like, mm. and I'll be like, oh, okay. <laughs> and for me now it's like, sure, I'll pivot. What do you need? You know what I mean? But when I first started, it was like, I, these people don't know what they're talking yeah. about. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So um, my creative process, it, it typically starts with like research. Um, and then I also like to ask, you know, whoever I'm talking to, whether it's like a personal client client or a brand, I'm just like, you know, like, what do you want people to feel is a big question. I always ask that, like, what do you want people to feel? What do you want them to like leave with or take away? Once I have a good understanding of that, I'm able to like, you know, draft a script around what that voice kind of looks like. Um, I typically look at people's, you know, if they have stuff that they've done before, um, and try to understand like, you know, like, do we like this? Do we not like this? Are we staying away from this? Are we doing more of this? I do enjoy like doing like layered things. So if like we're referencing, like we're doing like a little nod to like, like traditional art. So like I go to a lot of museums. I like to be inspired by like, I have a bunch of like coffee table books. Like I try to like incorporate a lot of like symbolism um, if possible, if it's like a 360 campaign, like, um, and then there are times where it's like, um, I've like presented something based on a brief that was like, okay, this is the brief. And it's like, okay, cool. Here's my idea. And then it's like, oh, well, this idea isn't big enough. And it'll be like, the idea is like, love black woman. And I'm like, it's not big enough. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like that's happened to me before. And that was, that was probably the last time that I felt a type of way. And like, and, but just like, you know, that's a, a bigger conversation. Like some of the things it's like, it's hard to detach from, especially when it's like, you feel like somebody is speaking to you. Like, no, mm-hmm. this isn't good enough. I'm not good enough. What do you mean? Right. But right. Than, like, what do you mean? Right. It's, like, it's almost as if like you're writing it from your own perspective and you're like, no, I, I know that this would resonate because I am this person, <laughs> you know, I'm who you're talking yeah. to. Exactly. And it's just like, at the end of the day, you know, 
it's a huge, like humans are human. So like client or your manager or your direct report, like they can be wrong. Like, yeah. And so yeah. I'm not afraid to like fight for things that I feel like when I feel like people are wrong, but I'm also not going to like go to war. Yeah. On something that isn't mine at all. You know? Yeah. Yeah. What has been your favorite project thus far? So something I actually don't talk about a lot um, because I do do like some copywriting. I was copywriting for this brand um, named A Day. They're a clothing line. and They're like a sustainable capsule based wardrobe uh, company. Right. And um, I was freelancing for them for a little bit, but I really like their, their like branding. Like I really liked their message, especially with like all the conversation around fast fashion. It was a company that like really was um intentional about the clothing that they were putting out and the material and um the quality of the pieces and i really enjoyed working with them because it was like it was fun and it was like they were cool to be like funky in their messaging and wording and i really like them but that's a project that or a company i used to work for that i really enjoyed and then i also really liked freelancing for netflix so like Strong Black Lens. There was another project called Banking for Us, which was about like the wealth gap in the Black community, Black and Brown. That's also on on YouTube. That was under Strong Black Lead as well. And then I did like The Circle one year, <laughs> which oh, I love. Because, yeah, I did like the marketing, like essentially like the marketing uh, campaign for like The Circle. I forget what season it was, but um, maybe it was like two seasons ago. But I like, I do enjoy like a, a reality TV. It's my like, turn off my brain and just watch something yeah. that I don't have to like. As, yeah, sometimes as you need that. What, yeah. well, I'm always curious as to the title, Like, what was your title over at Netflix? Oh, so I was like a freelancer straight mm -hmm. up. So like, um, I, you know, like sometimes when you're a freelancer, you're like hired by another company that, okay. that do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I was just like a creative writer for them. So okay. I did everything from title, like exploration. So like sometimes people get hired for, and I'm sure you know this, um, for like, okay, we have a show and this is what it's about and this is the pilot, but we don't know what the what name it should be. Mm -hmm. Can you read the script or watch the, the series and you know come up with some titles yeah. so i've done that a few times okay um, no that's and, cool and i've you, never I, I never i didn't know about that yeah yeah so they, they'll hire like a, a creative writer or a copywriter to do that work and i've done that a few times sometimes they go for it and sometimes they don't i've also done that with like taglines like i did that with um run the world the, the season two that just came out I but again seen that yet i want to see that <laughs> i will say season two is light years better than season one yeah <laughs> light years i like, gotta get into it it's because i don't yeah. have stars that's that's why i haven't watched it what's your dream project or collab it's so hard man like it's so funny that we're having this conversation right now i would love to to run like promo or development for who hooray for isa's oh, company hooray yes yeah i think like isa's company um or even like i mean this it's more sport sport ball -y over there but uh lebron's <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm corny for saying that. It's no, like, no, you're this good. <laughs> no, but yeah, like I think like working with Issa and the projects that she does, um, mm -hmm. I think like I'm super aligned with them as far as like the, you know, what what they could take on and, and like how, also like just like certain creatives are just like, I don't even want to say risk takers, but they just get it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's like, it's like Lil Nas X on Twitter. Like he just gets it. Yeah. Like you have to like, you know, beat beat the horse down. Like it's just like it's it's simple and it doesn't have to be like this like, oh right. Tiptoe around. Like right. people just So we're we're putting it out there in the universe. Hooray yeah. or or LeBron James. What inspires you? People who have stories but don't have platforms inspires mm. me. Yeah, I like that's a great answer. Music wise, because you're a DJ, what artists are you listening to right now? So I listen to a lot of selection radio. They mm -hmm. usually have a good mix going. It's a, it's usually a vibe. Mm -hmm. um, solo artists, uh, Coco Jones, mm -hmm. really have been enjoying her. Um, 
upcoming as an artist. Who else am I listening to? I listen to a lot of like Isaiah Rashad, Tyler the Creator. Nice, nice. I have to look some of those people up. Do you mm-hmm. ever want to take a break from it all? Oh yeah. I mean, so Blavity laid me off in September. And so I've been on this like break <laughs> since. Um, it's almost like I'm almost like I'm like 10 months into it. Mm-hmm. But and during that time, that's when I like got my yoga teacher certification. So mm-hmm. while I've been on a break, I've also been like doing a lot of things like the pivot has become more internal than yeah. external. Okay. And so it feels like I've been on break. Like I'm kind of now feeling like I'm in a season where I'm like, you know, like stepping out the cocoon. Like it's been wild because internally and mentally I have been doing like a lot of work and feel like I'm in a like really good, I'm in the best place ever. But then it's like the traditional stuff, like the career stuff, like the project stuff. I'm like, okay, what's going on? And especially with the strike, it's like, okay, what's going on? Thankfully, the break prepared me for that, like from a mental place. And and now it's like, okay, well, I have other things I can offer um, to the community. Like, let's lean into that. And I feel like I'm ready to like go full speed. Yeah. So when you got your Mm -hmm. yogi certificate, did you also get the Reiki practitioner certificate too? Was that hand in hand? No, um, I did my Reiki um, certificate I got back in like 2020. Okay. 2020. Yeah, okay. it was during the pandemic. Yeah. I love your career story, and I feel like you have a very bright future. Like when you get mm. back into it, I'm not even. I'm not even worried. Like you're definitely gonna just kill the game. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, so let's get into these rapid fire questions, and you can only give one answer. You ready? Yes. All right. Future mommy or forever auntie? <laughs> Oh my God, that's such a heavy one to start with. (laughs) Girl, I don't know. I have a dog. (laughs) Where's the one word answer? You got to choose either or. Shit, that's my answer. All right, we're going to come back to that. Um, get, Get your hair done or do it yourself. I'm getting my hair done. Makeup or natural face? Natural face. TikTok or IG? TikTok. Oprah or Michelle Obama? Michelle Obama. Books? (laughs) Books or chat GPT summaries? (laughs) It's books. It's books. Prose or poetry? Prose? Yeah. How come nobody knows prose? (laughs) I guess because I was on speech and debate when I was in high school. Prose is just a story. And then poetry, you know, poems. I'll do prose. Okay. Because I heard speech word there and I'm like (laughs) (laughs) um compa or reggae Ooh, I gotta go compa I gotta it's reggae (laughs) (laughs) listen it's a hard it's a hard answer for me too but you know (laughs) working for yourself or working for somebody oh man I guess I'm working for myself (laughs) I mean, you don't have just. I mean, just because that's where you are right now doesn't mean that that has to be. No, I know. I would. I think it's both the same thing, honestly. Okay. You, got clients, you know, it'd yeah. Be, yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. a guaranteed check or maybe a guaranteed check. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Work out or ice cream? Work out. Rest and relaxation or hustle harder? I'm resting down. <laughs> Rest. Sneakers or pumps? Speakers. Outcast or a tribe called Quest? Oh, that's hard. Oh, tribe. tribe. <laughs> High school or college? Uh, college for sure. Trading or real estate? Real estate. Last one. Insecure or rap ish? Oh, insecure. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> no shade. <laughs> no shade. But I have a I have an unpopular opinion. What is that? Share it. I felt like Issa was the villain in Insecure and not Molly. Wow. And yeah. I think that Issa's character had no character, like she had no development in over the four seasons. And no, then it was like- she went from not working 
to trying to figure out her life and then like what we all do in our 20s and then she figured out her life yeah but i'm talking about like personal development as she a did character. that too <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna have to debate on this another time <laughs> like offline 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 she had the least amount of development like compared to to molly what? molly and Lawrence, there we go. Okay, I think that they, I think they grew more as people in the in the show than Issa did. Interesting. That's a that's know, a very I interesting know. opinion. I'm not, I'm not looking for you to, to agree. Just, no, no, no. I just I think that's interesting because I watched the whole the whole season too. So I mean, yeah, all of the seasons. So uh, yeah. it was so great speaking to you. I think yeah. like you're amazing. I love your demeanor. I think you're you're so creative. I've seen. I've looked at all of your work, and I wish you the best. Tell everybody where they can find you. I appreciate that, first of all. So thank you. And thanks for inviting me on here. This was fun. Y'all can follow me at fab underscore rock pretty much on every platform. Or you can hit me if you want to contact me. My website is fabrockpresents.com. And all my work is there too, if you want to check it out. Yay! I had one question that was in rapid fire, but I was like, this is not really a rapid fire question, but I'll ask you this question before we go. Um, what artist do you think deserves a Tiny Desk um, session, mm. NPR Tiny Desk? Has Victoria Monet done one yet? No, but that's good. Yeah, she's... That's good. Mama, because I get it from my mama. <laughs> like, <laughs> she's incredible live. Like, literally, I saw her at uh, one of the festivals, and I literally was, like, blown away. And she was on, like, this small stage. I'm like, put her on the stage. She's on tour now, so if you can catch her, please do. She's Nice. Great. Yeah, I met her in L.A. at some music thing they were doing, and mm-hmm. we actually have a picture together, and that's how, that's how I, like, first found out about her, too. So, yeah, I love her, too. She's a great All artist. Right. All yeah. right, say bye to my TikTok folks. Bye, TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening to the podcast. I appreciate all of you and I'd love for you to subscribe, like, comment, and I'll see you in the next video.